Elegimos dedicarnos a la felicidad, porque la felicidad es la vacuna psicológica de nuestros tiempos. Las crisis son el momento indicado para reconocer nuestras fortalezas y descubrir nuestro ingenio para superar la adversidad. Hoy es tu momento de crecer, es tu momento de crear y de reinventarte. Ivy es parte de tu equipo y trabajamos contigo para apoyarte y lograr lo inimaginable en tu organización. Apoyamos a los mejores líderes, a los que han elegido darlo todo por su equipo, por sus sueños, por su mundo. Ivy es tu aliado. Elige la felicidad. Hola a todos. Me da muchísimo gusto darles la bienvenida. No se oye, perdón. Me, me, me confirman si se oye, se por favor. Bien. ¿Sí? Sí, se escucha, se escucha bien, bien, se escucha bien. Okay, se escucha a, bien. A lo mejor, Pola, es tu, eh, tu micrófono. Eh, ahorita alguien de, de, eh, eh, de soporte técnico a lo mejor te puede ayudar por el chat, pero es un gusto enorme darles a todos la bienvenida. De verdad, eh, hoy es un día muy, muy especial. Para mí es un día muy especial para el Instituto de Bienestar Integral. Mi nombre es Arlene Solotkin, para quienes no me conocen, y soy directora justamente del instituto, un instituto que se formó hace siete años con la intención de acercar al mundo de habla hispana a los mejores eh, representantes de la psicología positiva, de la psicología humanista del mundo, eh, con el fin de poder ayudar a nuestras comunidades a florecer. Eh, de forma personal, en nuestra vida personal y, por supuesto, eh, en nuestra vida profesional, porque todo está conectado. Para los que no han participado con nosotros anteriormente, eh, hay traducción simultánea y ustedes pueden elegir la interpretación apretando el mundito de abajo y eligiendo el idioma de su preferencia. El webinar va a durar alrededor de 45 minutos y después va a haber eh, una oportunidad para que hagan preguntas directamente al doctor eh, Scott Barry Kaufman. Eh, y bueno, pues eh, la idea es crecer, divertirnos y sobre todo aprender herramientas eh, y, 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 y tener experiencias que nos hagan crecer y sentirnos mejores personas cada día. Eh, hoy es un día muy especial, como les digo. Eh, tenemos con nosotros a uno de los más grandes líderes a nivel mundial en el estudio de la inteligencia, de la creatividad, de la imaginación y, eh, y bueno, de, de, de la psicología humanista, de la trascendencia de la autorrealización. Scott es un científico cognitivo, psicólogo humanista que se formó en muchas universidades muy importantes y ha participado eh, también impartiendo clases en universidades eh, como Columbia, Yale, NYU, UPenn, entre muchas otras. Eh, obtuvo, eh, bueno, es el fundador, perdón, y director de la ciencia, eh, del Centro para la Ciencia del Potencial Humano. Es conductor del podcast de número uno en psicología que se llama The Psychology Podcast, del que soy fan eh, número uno, yo creo. Y bueno, Scott fue nombrado por Business Insider eh, como uno de los 50 científicos más innovadores de la actualidad y que están cambiando la forma en la que vemos el mundo. Ha escrito para eh, The Atlantic, Scientific American, Psychology Today, Harvard Bus Business Review. Ha escrito eh, nueve libros, entre ellos está el más reciente libro que se llama Trascender y tiene un nuevo libro en camino que se llama Choose Growth, que ya lo pueden ir comprando eh, aunque todavía no sale. Y bueno, eh, es, es un honor eh, verdaderamente contar con, con él el día de hoy. Dear Scott, it's a real honor to have you here with us. Um, welcome. To... Hola a todos. Mil gracias por la invitación. 
Ay, muchas gracias. Thank you, Scott. Did you understand anything I just said? Everything, everything. Ah. I didn't know your Spanish was so good. <laughs> I'm just reading it from the comments. <laughs> <laughs> good, Scott. Uh, well, you know, I, I am very happy uh, that you accepted to, to be part of this today yes. because uh, on top of everything you have done for, for the science of, of human flourishing and, and human development, um, I think you are doing a, a, a really important work in advocating for um, understanding and embracing our common humanity. Uh, now in a time uh, where we are facing so much division in many ways, you know, uh, I, I don't yeah. even have to, to specify all of them, but I, I would really would like to invite you to share with us uh, your view about, you know, human transcendence and also uh, why is it so important to, to welcome um, a language and a conversation among us human beings where we can actually touch upon differences but always aiming at uh, fostering, you know, love and understanding. Oh wow, those are those are really big questions. Um, Abraham Maslow, the humanistic psychologist, had a number of phrases that most people have never heard of, and when I discovered them, I really uh, resonated with them deeply. Uh, one phrase he talked a lot about: be love. Um, he had a whole model in which um, we have a lot of deficiency needs that must be met in order um, to, uh, to, to, to really have the time and attention to focus on our higher selves. Um, uh, but he also talked about growth needs or being needs, um, the be needs of life um, that are just as important and we often neglect them. Things like uh, justice, beauty, uh, excellence, um, meaningfulness. Um, and these sorts of be needs um, are things that uh, really help get us outside of ourselves. Um, uh, we are often spend so much time focused on our deficiency needs and getting those needs um, met to a certain degree. Um, and then Maslow proposed there's, there's, there's be love. Be love is love for the being of others. And it's something that's a little bit different than the need for connection, for instance. Um, you can have uh, and feel great connection to others, but not feel a transcendent uh, uh, sense of unconditional love and a giving, a giving sort of drive towards, towards all of humanity. Um, is, is someone translating everything I'm saying right now? Is that, is that what's happening? Yes, somebody is translating. I love it. I love yes. it. So people are actually understanding what I'm saying right now? Uh, supposedly, yes. Maybe Ivan can also share with us if, if he needs you to slow a little bit more, but I think- Give me directions <laughs> if, I, if I'm going too fast. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, please. It'll give, uh, it'll give you a little bit of a break. Um, so the other big concept I wanna introduce into this conversation is not only the notion of be love, but also the notion that Maslow talked about as uh, dichotomy transcendence. Um, at the higher level of consciousness, and, and I call for, by the way, I teach an eight week course and, uh, and my graduates, I call them transcenders, because that's the phrase that Maslow used. And I'm one of them. Oh, that's yeah. right. You're a transcender. You're a transcender. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and transcenders really do um, uh, think, they don't think in terms of all the sort of polarized ways that, that humans think these days. Um, they're really able at uh, taking seemingly incompatible states of being or incompatible um, views, seemingly incompatible views, and coming up with a higher level of an integration among them and, um, and really being able to uh, uh, see a bigger picture of humanity that isn't so tied to your own individual identity. Um, so I'll pause there and just by introducing those concepts, uh, it's all a new vocabulary as well um, that most people are probably not uh, familiar with those two terms. Yeah, so it, it, uh, it's uh, our capacity to tap into 
or expanding our own sense of reality in some ways, right? Where we feel connected yes. with others and we feel connected to other people's experiences, even if we have not lived the same life or even if we have not experienced the same challenges, but it's uh, actually uh, like experiencing that, as yes. you said, that love of humanity that goes beyond uh, our own personal experiences in many ways. Um, yeah, to a very large degree. Um, yeah, yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, and and so uh, I I think it, it is uh, it it will be interesting uh, to to know uh, how did you uh, come about uh, how. Could, how did you come to uh, explore Maslow's uh, theory and go, uh, you know, to do research in his own personal journeys? And why did you take on this incredible uh, endeavor? And uh, why was this important to you uh, on the one hand? And perhaps you can share a little bit of what this uh, journey has been for you because maybe for 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 some people today this is a new uh, you know a new exploration so uh, can can you share that with us scott you mean for some people today this is the first time they've heard of me is that what you mean uh, yes or they don't know exactly <laughs> your journey in terms of uh, of course of of I, of, of, of course. Uh, exploring maslow's theory and you know you you write about him as your you know a best friend who you never really it's met. Sure, a so, dear friend. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people might not. Uh, I don't assume they've known about my whole life story, but I uh, was uh, had some difficult educational experiences when I was a child that made it very hard for me to uh, process information in real time. Um, uh, just like our poor translator here <laughs> has to constantly keep up with me. I'm trying, hopefully I'm talking well, good enough here. He's doing such a great job. But, um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I really uh, thought there was greater potential for me and for others. And I, 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 it's been good to dedicate my career to try to, to human potential. But when I first started off in the field, in my journey, I started off by studying IQ testing. Um, I wasn't, uh, I didn't start off as like a positive psychologist, right? I was a, I was a cognitive scientist. So I was very interested in intelligence um, as traditionally defined. And I wanted to kind of have us think more broadly about what intelligence means um, and what it could mean, um, especially in people who um, have lots of different uh, uh, neurodiverse ways of thinking. Um, so that was early on in my career and my journey. Um, and then I uh, got hired uh, by Martin Seligman to uh, help him run something called the Imagination Institute at University of Pennsylvania. And we, I really got, and I, and I was studying uh, creativity and imagination and how that differs from intelligence. And that really set me up well for discovering Maslow's work. When I was teaching at Penn, uh, I was teaching Angela Duckworth's class, Positive Psychology, because she was off busy writing her book, Grit. Um, I taught her class and loved teaching the class, very grateful for the opportunity. Um, and that I was doing research on the history of the field of positive psychology. And um, I stumbled upon uh, the writings of the humanistic psychologists. And I really fell in love with that way of thinking about human nature. Um, it wasn't... Um, so optimistic that you're blind to uh, the naughty bits of humans. I wonder how he translated that, that one, <laughs> naughty bits. <laughs> I don't know if that translates well, but, um, but it's not so positive that we ignore the naughty bits of humans, but it's also not so pessimistic that we don't acknowledge the, the potential for growth in humans. And so um, I really fell in love with that way of thinking and I uh, led me down some rabbit holes. And uh, I read his journal, Maslow's personal journals, um, and discovered that he never drew a pyramid. And, you know, I discovered just how misrepresented his ideas of self actualization were. I felt a personal calling to write a book about it. 
Um, I also felt as though the idea and notion of self-actualization was missing in the field of positive psychology. So oh yeah, I had multiple purposes uh, for doing this. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. And I invite everyone to write any questions they might, that they, they might be having. But um, yeah, when, when, uh, when we talk about Maslow or what we might all know about Maslow is actually that pyramid that you made reference to where you have to kind of get the basic needs met and uh, walk your way up the pyramid until uh, uh, self-actualization, right? And you are proposing something uh, very different, a more dynamic approach to human yeah. development and human growth. And uh, I think this is uh, very important because uh, oftentimes we tend to feel that um, uh, transcendence or, or even uh, self-actualization is a luxury for some, but it's actually not. Like even in, in, in very difficult circumstances, people have the capacity to, to, it might be more difficult in some circumstances, of course, but uh, we all have the capacity to grow. And uh, I think um, I would like to invite you to, to dive deeper into that uh, framework, if you, if you can. My, uh, my sailboat metaphor? Yeah. Sure, um, just doing a little bit of a test right now. I clicked on the Spanish thing, so I, that's so cool. As I'm talking, I'm hearing him, I'm <laughs> hearing him, yeah. I heard you, buddy. I heard you. Okay, now I'm back on English. I'm back on English now. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a very curious human, and I can't help myself from being curious. That was so cool. Okay, I'm back now. Um, yeah, so the sailboat metaphor um, is, you know, sort of this way um, uh, of, of, of thinking about life as not a trek up a mountain or like a, uh, like a, a journey up a pyramid, <laughs> but, but really you have to make sure all the parts of yourself are working together. You're not constantly moving in the world with different parts of you fighting each other. And I think like a vehicle, like a whole vehicle, like a sailboat is a great metaphor for, for this because, you know, you have the, the, the parts of the, the boat, um, which if there's too many holes in the boat itself, you know, water will come in and you'll sink. So you certainly need a basic foundation but you won't move anywhere unless you eventually open up that sail and move. And once you start moving, um, you know, the, the, there's a vast unknown of the sea. Anything can happen. Um, and you still have to um, know which port, you know, know what your calling is, knowing what port are you moving toward and have that sort of agency. But knowing full well that there's so much unpredictable things that can arise at any point in time. Um, so I think that dynamic between the safety of the safe harbor of the boat and the uh, growth of the journey or the exploration when you open the sail is a better way of conceptualizing the self-actualization journey than a static uh, pyramid. I don't know if that was uh, along the lines of what you were asking me. <laughs> Yeah, I think pe you know we, we, people here might be more familiar with the with Maslow's pyramid, what, which was not actually an intention of his to create. It was more like a marketing effort, from what I understand, and from that's what right. you, you have shared before. Well, that's that's right. Um, a bunch of uh, management consultants um, in their textbooks in the '60s depicted it as a pyramid with uh, the self-realized man at top with a flagpole. You know, you think about 60s management it was very sexist and, um, you know, we need to update it. We need to revise the models, okay? Um, it was really co-opted for their own purposes, but, but Maslow, uh, well, I hope, I hope he would be proud of what I did. Who knows? <laughs> I, and, uh... I think I, I I think by the way he he would be <laughs> he's you think so <laughs> your 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 work has been so so profound and and I want to ask you uh, 
we we are living in difficult times we still have the pandemic you know going on we have a lot of political uh, you know uh, struggles that are happening in in the world uh, poverty levels like a lot of things that that uh, can make it very hard for people to conceptualize the possibility of uh, you know, becoming self-realized, you know? And, yeah. uh, and some people also wonder, you know, what about purpose? Where can I find my purpose in, in life? And if I don't find purpose, then I will not transcend and I will not get to experience everything that I can be. And that's yeah. a very, you know, that's a very big question that I think has a lot of myths. And uh, what, you know, what, what is your take on purpose and, and finding meaning in life? It has a lot of, what did you say, myths? Myths. Uh, myths. myths, like- and, Myths, myths, yes. gotcha, <laughs> May, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, me meaning is an interesting one because meaning is something that is a kind of a thread running through all of them in some way or another. Um, uh, I really like the, the research that's being done in the field on this topic um, and the differentiation between different kinds of meaning that can exist in the world. You can, the, you can have a sense of coherence, which is a, a kind of meaning that um, you seek when so much is unpredictable, unpredictable in your environment. You just want some sense of predictability so you can know um, uh, what's what's going on? That's coherence, and that's different than purpose. Having a, a calling, having a sense of um, a higher order. Um, you know what 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 port are you sailing to? What is what is the greatest port that will help you feel uh, like your your whole self is being utilized? Um, and um, and then there's also a uh, a form of meaning called significance which is a very interesting one. Uh, Michael Steger and his colleagues have been investigating this. He's a terrific uh, researcher. Um, and, and, and the significance one is you can still feel purpose, but it's kind of at the end of the day, existentially feel what's the point of it all. You know, I mean, we're gonna die, so we're all gonna, I mean, not to put a downer on any <laughs> here, but you know, like someday we all die, someday, you know, the world moves on. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people who get depressed, they really get stuck at the, uh, the significance one. Um, so I think like, you know, being able to feel like you matter is really important. Um, feeling like you, uh, you have a higher order goal that general that, that energizes you in life and feeling like your immediate environment has a good sense of coherence and makes sense and isn't too, uh, having too much, uh, uh, volatility, um, then uh, I think those things tend to lead to a happier life. Yeah, so uh, I, I see one of the questions that um, uh, one of the attendees is asking is if you can uh, share a little bit more about self-actualization and what does that really mean? Um, for people to, to, to understand? I view self-actualization as very similar, if not the same thing as creativity. Um, to me, uh, creativity and self-actualization self self are things um, that um, when we develop the unique aspect, the most unique aspects of ourselves, and, you know, the, the, the lower needs, like the needs for connection, the needs for security, the need for self-esteem, those are all needs that are obviously very important, but those are needs that we kind of share with others. But not everyone has the need to play a world-class a world -class cello concerto. Not everyone has the need uh, to be Arlen and, uh, and have uh, these beautiful uh, webinars that she hosts and um, and, and the good work she does, right? So, so there's something very unique about Arlen that only you know, Arlen can, can self-actualize, um, that, that no one else can self-actualize those potentialities as good as Arlen can. 
and finding those things. Um, and sometimes it takes quite a lifetime to find those things, um, but finding them and really committing to them is, is what I mean by self-actualization. Yeah, and can you be working towards your own formula without knowing oh, yes. it consciously? Because oftentimes we, we do what we are good at, we do what we love to do, but sometimes rationally we are not aware that we're doing it. It's like, you yeah. know, the, the fish in the water who doesn't know that he's swimming, you know, or, you know, the dancer who, who is so much, you know, who, who loves to be immersed in the music and, and is not completely aware of it. Can, can that be happening to some of us? Oh, well, absolutely. Uh, so much of life is making the unconscious conscious, isn't it? That's that's where the, all the all the self development works. I mean, that's very Carl Jungian of you. Um, <laughs> that's depth. There's a whole field called depth psychology, which is all about that. Um, you know, I I, I um, in my research, I'm very interested in the dark side of human nature as well. Um, again, that's why I call myself a humanistic psychologist, not necessarily a positive psychologist, because I really am interested in um, the dark side of human nature and. Um, and, and dark personalities and how we all can uh, have dark personalities uh, activated depending on our context, depending on tr different triggers we have. Um, and uh, yeah, being able to come to a great sense of acceptance of your dark side and, um, and integrating it um, and, 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 uh, and channeling it towards greater creativity. Um, that's what the humanistic psychologist role may um, talked a lot about in terms of the, di the daimonic and how the daimonic is uh, neither it's the, it, it could take over the whole person or it can be channeled towards the greatest forms of creativity. Yeah, so, so maybe you can talk about the relationship or the differences between the dark and the light triad because you have studied both and I think that's really important because sometimes in psychology we find certain fields that focus only on the dark side you know or focus only on the on the light side but it's interesting mm -hmm. uh, to see how you have been able to to integrate and study both of them and i from from what i read and learned from you uh, it's especially uh, that capacity that we have as human beings to to be able to inquire about our own nature so that we can be more intentional in our efforts in order to uh, self-actualize, but also to transcend and, and to be part um, of, of, uh, of humanity. Mm. Well, I love what you're saying. I love what you're saying. Uh, what was your specific question for me? The, the light and dark triad, yeah, uh, you if want to you explain can, it? Uh, yeah, if you can elaborate a bit more on how we can integrate both aspects of our being. Well, I will put a link in the chat window and people can take my free test that will tell you um, how, 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 how much of an asshole you are. <laughs> oh, you find this test. Um, uh, there we go. Um, and uh, feel free, uh, you know, take it while I'm talking and uh, put in your score. Um, because what I was really curious, uh, did that go through in the chat window? Yeah. Because um, I was curious, you know, there are a lot of jerks out there, right? And, and they have a certain uh, constellation of personality traits. Um, they tend to score high. Has anyone ever met a jerk before in this room? Has a, anyone in this room met a jerk? Do they know anyone in their life? Do they know anyone in their life who is narcissistic, um, a psycho, psychopathic, a liar, um, and uh, they score very high in Machiavellianism, which uh, I have no idea how that's translated, Machiavellianism, but it's like um, they're always strategizing about what they can ex how they can exploit others. So... Um, Anyone have an ex-boyfriend like that? <laughs> yeah, because you always hear about, or ex-girlfriend, I should say. Um, but um, 
the thing is, uh, in it, it, I felt like there was nothing in the psychological literature that shot that had a that 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 shined a spotlight on the opposite personality, and that bothered me because I, um, I you know, you go you go to like the Netflix documentaries, and they're like all about serial killers, you know, and it's like. It, and it's just like I I, I was exa- I was very uh, frustrated by this, and I uh, went into my colleague David Yaden's office at the Positive Psychology Center, and I said, "Is there anything interesting at all about people who aren't assholes? You know, like, is it are they interesting at all? Like, are they worthy of studying?" Um, and uh, and and so it, it it started a whole research program. Just that one question. That's that was my scientific research question. And that opened up a whole research program, which we call the Light Triad now. Um, and the Light Triad um, comprises three elements that we think um, people who score high in these three elements, not well, not we think, we have enough data now to say mm-hmm. that people who score high in these three elements live a happier life. They live a more fulfilled life. They are more, they find more meaning. Um, It turns out that psychopaths aren't very happy, um, is what we found in our research. Um, So the light triad characteristics are um, uh, humanism, um, which is seeing the the inherent dignity and worth of each individual. Um, uh, Kantianism, uh, which is the opposite of Machiavellianism, which is um, not using people as a means to an end, but really uh, treating people as an end to themselves. Um, uh, you're not trying to get anything out of them. And uh, faith in humanity, um, believing that despite all of our imperfections, humans are basically good. It's a belief system, um, which is very different. Belief, it's a very different belief system than people who score high on the dark triad. So you can uh, take the test yourself. I put the link in there. Um, some of you, uh, if there are any Darth Vader's in the room, let me know. Uh, so I avoid you, <laughs> but, uh, we, we put it in terms of a star Wars thing. So it'll tell you whether or not you're a Darth Vader or you're a Jedi <laughs> or are Yoda. Yeah. Well, I think this, the, the, you know, this study it's, it's so important and it is also once again, aligned with Maslow's idea that it is important to, to, to study and look at the best people, you know, at, at, at wonderful human beings that have walked uh, the earth and, and learning from them. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I've been uh, listening a lot uh, uh, and reading, you know, some of your uh, other books as well. I, uh, I was able to, to finish uh, the uh, Ungifted not long uh-huh. ago where you share, you know, uh, many important stories of your personal journey and your personal life. Yes. But you also highlight how there are some very important, or there, there were, and I'm sure they still are, some wonderful people that uh, were able to, to lift the ceiling for you in many ways, you know. We That's all true. have these amazing people who support us, and who uh, yeah. care about us in in unconditional ways, and uh, and we oftentimes don't pay enough attention, you know, to to those people who are really like angels working walking on earth for us. And uh, and I, I wanted to to uh, to invite you if you feel comfortable, Scott, to share a little bit about. Uh, those angels that you that you had in your life, uh, I I remember in one of those stories, um, you know, the secretary of 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 the the uh, the I think it was the special ed department where you <laughs> went and you were asking, you know, can I I want to learn something more? I want to move into a different, uh, you know course and 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 this secretary said you don't move until you are heard until somebody hears what you're asking for you know and 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 that's how you were you know sitting in this office waiting for the you know for the person in charge 
of, uh, uh, I don't know if it was the gifted education or, or, or another department until finally they were able to listen to you and that's how you were able to, um, you know, to, uh, to advance in the way that you wanted. You advocated for yourself, but you also had this wonderful person that was uh, there for you, you know, uh, asking you not to give up. So uh, I don't know if you can share how, how having someone that lifts, that helps you lift that ceiling up can really help you or me create a different reality altogether. Oh, I mean, it, having a support system is so important. Um, I think every human should have their own coach, like every single human. Um, growing up as a kid should have their own coach. Um, it's something that I, um, I'm actually working towards that right now. I'm uh, creating a, a self-actualization coaching certification program for coaches as well as teachers. So uh, keep, stay tuned, stay tuned for that <laughs> one um, uh, next year. Um, but um, I just think that, being, that we should underestimate the value of having someone in your life who challenges you to, to reach for something higher than, than maybe the default that people expect of you. And I did have that such a person in, in ninth grade who asked me what I was still doing there and, uh, and, uh, and, and saw something greater in me. And uh, I want everyone to have su such a person. Why just me <laughs> in, in my school system? Uh, why not all the kids? Um, yeah, there's, we leave so much potential behind. And even as adults, we leave so much potential behind. Uh, William James, the founder of psychology, really talked about this in a beautiful way. Um, you know, saying how we all have such extremes of use that we just don't, we don't put to use. We have such extreme potential because uh, we get in our own way. Yeah. So that there is good in the world, and that's something we have to remind ourselves over and over again. But um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I I saw one question also among our audience that were that was asking if uh, what what uh, what made you become a scientist? Why why did you choose that area uh, for your life? for your professional life? Well, I, I did choose science because I wanted to make a change in our measurement of intelligence and uh, the way that we think about intelligence. And I thought that would be the best route. I mean, psychology, psychology is really, you know, psych, I guess you can call it psychological science. Uh, I didn't want to become like a biologist, you know, like, or a chemist, but uh, a, a brain scientist um, because Human psychology is uh, is 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 sometimes is often our most limiting thing. Of course, there are environmental factors that are um, that can enhance that, but environmental factors can't do everything. Can't can't do all the work for you. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 that's uh, the, there's a lot right right there no i know <laughs> i know i know that that's a political hot potato <laughs> <laughs> that's one i agree <laughs> so uh, eduardo is asking you know what what have you found um about uh, uh about self um self-actualization uh, on top of what maslow shared you know uh, did you find something else uh, besides what Maslow uh, wrote about in terms of self-actualization? Well, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, that's Eduardo. If, if he, Eduardo, si quieres tomar el, el, el micrófono, if you want to open up your mic. But yeah, he's saying, what have you found about uh, uh, self-actualization on top of what Maslow uh, wrote about? 
Did you well, find something yes. new? Yeah. <laughs> Have I done anything new? <laughs> no, did you find something new? <laughs> it's all no. I just write about Maslow. Um, yes, um, I I've done a lot of research, um, uh, trying to extend a lot of those ideas. Um, so, for instance, the light dark triad I think is is uh, new. Um, I also I created a self actualization test. I went in and I I tried to measure um, to see which of his characteristics of self actualization where um uh would hold up for for scientific scrutiny and i found a bunch of um uh, a bunch of um uh, about 10 of them could um you can take all the tests for free I, i'm putting all these links in there um, and that includes the self-actualization test the characteristics of self-actualization scale um yeah in terms of self-actualization i've also been looking at transcendence and uh and doing some research with david yaden on the all the awe experience and, and how that's very important. Um, but most recently, I've really kind of taken a step back from research um, uh, and, and really got into the coaching world. And, uh, and I'm really trying to master that world and uh, see what I can do to bring to bring a very practical um, uh, research got boring. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me when I said that, please keep that a secret. Uh, but um, it got to a point where I didn't feel like I was helping enough people. And, and I started to ask myself, what am I doing with the short time I have on this earth when three people are reading my papers? I want to help millions of people. So um, that's kind of the direction I've changed in the past couple of years. Yeah. I, I I think a lot of us will appreciate that that take on, so. on on your on your work and uh, and to to making an impact in in the in the lives of so many people. So yeah. um, you know I I I would like to open up the space for people to actually ask questions also uh, live. You know we want to hear your voices and welcome oh, yes. uh, everybody's thoughts. Um, I just want to end this part by saying a, a quote that you often refer to that, you know, one can choose uh, to go back to safety or, or forward towards growth. And growth must be chosen again and again, and fear must be overcome again and again. And I think uh, this, this quote is, is beautiful because many of us live in fear not only of fear of what might happen wrong, but also fear of our own potential and our own uh, capacity to, to, to achieve uh, what we are set in this world to do. And that's actually what you're doing also, Scott. So um, I don't know if you have something to say about that specific quote. And please, anybody that wants to ask any questions, you can raise your hand and or write it and we will uh, read it or allow you to speak um absolutely um i want to thank mail hardy thank you very much for sharing some of my articles um what i've done is i've put a link there uh to my whole research all my research pages papers I think i may have over a, almost 100 or so or maybe 50 i don't know <laughs> but whatever uh, there's a lot of reading that you can do if you're really bored <laughs> <You> <laughs> You can see all the graphs. <laughs> yeah. Do you like my sense of humor, Arlen? Am I okay? Am I, I being inappropriate? I, I, yeah. I love your sense of humor. Yeah. I don't always get it because of the I language, know. but I I, 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 I always admire you're so authentic and. and thank you. Thank yeah. you. I have trouble. T I have trouble taking anything seriously. So I, it, uh, but I, but I do care deeply about the work I do, but. I, just, I know. You know. I feel like academics take themselves too seriously sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I know. So uh, we have this, uh, Eduardo, please, adelante. Hello. You, you can activate your microphone. Yeah. Okay, listo. Yo lo tengo encendido. Uh, uh, Scott, can you go to, to Ivan? He can translate for you if he speaks in, in Spanish. Adelante. Okay. La pregunta es que... Eh, más lo expuso de que del 1 al 2%, claro, cuando más lo escribió, eran las personas que llegaban al estado de autorrealización, 
Scott ha hecho la continuación de estudios sobre autorrealización y mi pregunta es si esa estadística de personas que realmente llegan a la autorrealización ha cambiado, si ahora somos más y más o menos qué porcentaje sería. I am really, really glad that you brought up that question. So that was one thing. I, in my book, I say Maslow got a couple things wrong. It's amazing how many things he got right. But there are a couple things he got really wrong. And that was one of them. He mostly studied his college students. And, you know, at age 18, how self-actualized are you, really? And he kind of generalized a lot of that to... Uh, to the general population. Um, I found in my scale that it really is a bell curve, just like any other trait, like IQ, like introversion, like, you know, uh, agreeableness. Uh, Self-actualization is really, uh, it, it's, it's on the bell curve. And um, th there is no threshold. See, that's that, the problem with the way of thinking about that is though, is like, oh, boop, that person's self-actualized. Oh. That person's not self-actualized. It's not a binary, <laughs> you know, where we can quantify, oh, 2% of the population, boop, you know, and everyone else is, forget about it, <laughs> forget about them. You know, that's not the way we should be thinking about the situation. Um, we should be thinking about it as we're all in the stage uh, process of, um, of, uh, of, of reaching our higher potentialities Um, uh, we're, we're in the stage of development. Um, uh, we're different stages of development. Uh, and, um, and there are, uh, there are geniuses that exist in this world. And I don't think genius is the same thing as self-actualization. Um, I, I try to make it very clear as Maslow made clear that, that, uh, achievement is not the same thing as self-actualization either. Um, lots of people, Uh, you can win a gold medal in the Olympics and and feel wholly unself-actualized. Um, so um, I think we need to think about it as constantly a state of development. But in terms of my scientific scale, the characteristics of self-actualization scale, I found it's a it's it's a it's a bell curve, and um, which means uh, you know uh, it will, if you want stats 101, it means most people are 66% in the middle, you know, um, but um, But it, 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 to say there's only like a few people that are self-actualized is not a fair thing to say. Do you have any follow-up question to that? Do, do I? Oh, no, the, uh, the individual. Ah, that, yeah. Eduardo. I, yeah, Eduardo. Sí, nada más. Entonces, ¿cuál sería, digamos, de todos los indicadores que él ha encontrado que influyen en la autorrealización, el más importante? Oh, now that's a very interesting question because I, I list 10 characteristics um, and, so, and they are all correlated with each other, which forms a, a higher order factor, you know, called self-actualization. So I can't tell you which is the most important one, but I can maybe tell you my favorite one because <laughs> that's subjective. Yeah, why, 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 why don't you begin telling us the, you know, the, the 10 characteristics so that, uh, or the 10 components? True, I, I have I them. I need to Google it. Oh, I need to I, Google I, it. Like, I have them here. I, it's, you know, truth seeking, acceptance. Yeah, am I right? Am I in the right? You are 100% correct. Purpose. Keep going. <laughs> purpose, authenticity, continued freshness of appreciation peak experiences, humanitarianism, good moral intuition, creative spirit, and equanimity. Beautiful, so beautiful. Th th these are all uh, the, the characteristics that uh, integrate into what's called uh, self-actualization, but which one is your, your favorite? Well, my favorite one is creative spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, one that can pervade all the rest of them. Um, would you, can you share why? Um, 
you can you can make up for a lack of a lot of things by having a creative by having an abundance yeah. of creative spirit. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna write that down. I like that quote. <laughs> <laughs> for a lack of many things but i'm going to tweet that one out later hold on a second by an abundance of great well you know because like uh i mean there's so many things like uh, as a kid i i wasn't the best at i wasn't i didn't show potential and uh i don't know you just keep finding new ways of of obtaining your goals i mean without my creative spirit i could have easily just given up uh not you know, not even going to college. I got rejected from the psychology program in college when I first applied. And then I figured out, I used my creative spirit to figure out another way in. I went in through my opera singing. And uh, then once I got into opera, I then went through the back door to psychology. Um, so, um, you know, a little, you know, like a, a little like loophole. You're not supposed to do that, right? You get rejected. You're supposed to just accept it, right? You're supposed to be like, oh, I'm not smart enough. But I didn't accept it. Um, and I think that was my creative spirit. As well as my grit, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 well, what, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you at the beginning was uh, actually about, your, you know, that, that part of your history, because you showed a lot of tenacity. There was some inner wisdom, even though there were a lot of labels put, you know, on top of you that uh, maybe were yeah. not did not pertain to you because uh, you know that educational systems tend not to be made for everyone unfortunately they favor certain types yeah. of people who learn in certain types of ways but uh, you it, it seemed to me at least when i read uh, about your life that uh, you knew inside that you were capable of anything that you set up, you know, set your mind to do. And that in, yes. some, in some moments, you perhaps uh, uh, became accustomed, not, not satisfied, but you kind of became used to the label that was placed on you, although you didn't like it. But in any opportunity that you had to try <laughs> something new, to prove yourself, to, to go beyond any yes. uh, expectations you, you did. And that's a combination of, uh, of perseverance. And uh, you, you mentioned also the, the social support and of course your creative um, spirit. A little narcissism. <laughs> yeah, but healthy perhaps, no? Like I'm joking, I'm joking, <laughs> folks. Calm down, calm down. Uh, a little bit of a uh, self-belief yeah. it doesn't hurt doesn't hurt anyone yeah yeah that's so so important and um and i think uh, i see another question and i think this might be related this idea of believing in yourself is that related also to to depression alejandra is saying depression is such a problem nowadays um, what can you tell people that are getting depressed? Uh, I really like self-transcendent uh, exercises to help people and lift them out of depression by lifting them out of themselves. Oh, I like that one too. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> I never know what's going to come out of my mouth. I'm joking. I'm really not that narcissistic. But um, uh, yeah, I, I really do think self-transcendent uh, exercises like... Um, uh, there's some really interesting research showing that like moral elevation, looking at examples of people that inspire you. Um, uh, I'm just, I'm looking up some of these studies. You, um, uh, yeah, they really can bring you, you know, getting in more of all like experiences, uh, listening to inspiring music, helping you um, find ways of being of service to others. I think is a better approach to helping people with depression than having them constantly talk about their depression yeah. and constantly ruminate and, uh, and, and, and be neurotic of, about what's wrong with them. Um, I, have, I have found personally in the, my clients, as well as the research literature, a lot of people who are depressed have transcendent moments where they have forgotten that they're depressed. 
-hmm. And those are beautiful moments because they've gone outside of themselves in some way. Yeah, I, I just to, to, to share a little bit about me, but at uh, different moments in my life, I have uh, felt depressed. I, I have not gotten to the point of taking medication or, um, or anything uh, so severe that I'm not able to function. But uh, I did find that when I began doing some uh, work on, you know, like social action, and began shifting the focus from myself to the world around me, uh, my depression began to lift. And yes. I felt my life had a purpose because the, the problem with depression is that we get, you know, to, we focus a lot on, 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 we feel guilty when we have everything and we're not doing yes. enough, or we feel we don't have anything to give out to the world, but we are constantly focusing on ourselves and at least in my case uh, really focusing on others uh, really was a healing process for me exactly and it's not you know uh it's not going to save everything you know like there, there are there's value to therapy yes <laughs> but but um i think that's an underutilized form of therapy so um, uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Yeah, and I, and I think, Scott, even that sometimes when, when we help others, we might tap as a surprise into uh, having a transcendent experience because uh, we, we can, well, at least, you know, in my case, by, by being immersed in other realities and, I, and by yes. being of service, uh, yes. I transcended uh, my pain and and I was able also to 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 feel connected to something much larger that filled me up with gratitude with hope you know so and, yes. and with, with the collective which is also another aspect I would say of of uh, getting into an extended expanded state of consciousness that for me is also transcendence I love it I love it uh, you should write more about that. <laughs> I love it. Mm. So, um, so I I know we are kind of getting to the end of the hour. Uh, I want to ask if someone else wants to ask a question live, but I also saw a question. How about how about male? I want to yes. meet male Hardy. Can exactly. I meet male Hardy? Where's male Hardy? <laughs> They're like the most active person on this thread. Yes, Male. She... Ma oh, Male. Sorry, Male. male. <laughs> Uh, where's Male? Where's Male? I, I don't know. Male, do you want to? Uh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm sorry. Yes, please. I'm putting, I'm putting poor Male on the spot. <laughs> Hi, Scott. <laughs> Hi, Male. How are you? Good. Do you want to ask me any question in person? I appreciate how, um, how much you've contributed in the chat window, the chat, the chat session. So. You're welcome. I am very, I was very excited to be here. So. Hmm. I want to ask um, about all this in, in, in transcendent. What is the problem? The anxiety and depression or, or is more the belonging thing, the sense of not belonging to the group or to, a, or, or to your community? Um, I'm sorry, can you ask the question one more time? My headphones are about to die and it just told me that my headphones are about to die. And I, I don't have my headphones, I am sorry. Can you listen okay, or I can go? Can, can you, you um, it's, it's my, my headphones are saying, oh, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, can you just ask are me a question one more time and uh, hopefully yes, my course. headphones will survive. Yes, yeah. of course. Yes, of course. I was thinking if depression and anxiety really the, the troubles, or maybe the trouble is this sense mm. of not be belonging to the group that that is a, the, the worst trouble instead of anxiety and depression? You know, it, it's a wonderful question and it's a very topical question. Um, I uh, might have a surprising answer for you. I might have a surprising answer for you. I think belonging is overrated. I know that everyone talks about it and positive psychology, they love it, you know, belonging, yes. the need. But I think that... Um, that belonging and your your constant desire to belong is is actually a cause of our anxiety. 
um, you know, and, uh, and in fact, we would do better to have more be love, which um, is why to, this comes full circle. This allows us, remember the first question you asked me? Um, I think having more of a be love and having an open heartedness to the world at large, leave your door and forget all the identities and cliques and political groups and just embrace your fellow human with openness and curiosity. I think that is the source of anxiety is that we're too focused on finding our tribe and we're not open-hearted enough to the people that come into our lives naturally. That is really the way I think about the situation. Thank you. Extraordinary answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? You like, did you like that answer? No, no, no. Extraordinary answer. I, oh, I like oh, the answer you. because sometimes yeah. we feel like I, I cannot belong. So I am yes. very sad because of that. And that is not the trouble. The trouble is, is other thing. Yeah. We're so focused on belonging yes, in, this is, in our society. That's and true. It's, imp it's important, but too much of that focus is a great source of our anxiety. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, now, Paulette, uh, I actually believe I took a course with Paulette, um, a coaching course. Is that right, Paulette? Yes, Scott, it's me. I, re <laughs> I, re I, rec I recognize you, yes. <laughs> Great to Hello, see you. Hello, how are you? I'm good, and I'm so excited. I'm, I was like all day long waiting for this moment, so it's oh. great to hear you. And I sent the invitation to our cohort of the certification, so it's great. Susana, oh, great. I think it's Susana is also here, that she was also part of the group. But oh. I wanted to ask you about how are you connecting coaching with your transcendence uh, theory? Because I... I've been seeing that you talk about both things together. And I, that would be very interesting for me as a, as a, as a, as a coach. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I have a new book coming out this year. Um, excuse me, that's called, uh, I just put a link in, it's called Choose Growth. Um, and um, it, it directly, I directly want to th think through how these various these various principles of overcoming your, your self-doubt and your fears in life and, um, and transcending your ego as well to a large degree and embracing the world, how those principles can be applied in the coaching world. I've been very, very interested about that. And um, I have a team of amazing, amazing people. Um, and we're, we're currently uh, designing uh, our own sort of uh, our own coaching, self actualization coaching program um, that will directly address those things. Um, but it's been a very interesting and fun challenge for me because um, uh, there's a lot of great stuff in the, in the coaching world, uh, including, you know, the, 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 who we learned from, Robert Biswas-Diener, um, really a, a legend. Um, but um, I think there's some, uh, there's some uh, aspects of the coaching world that doesn't uh, fully integrate humanistic psychology to the extent to which I see a great, a great potential to, br to bring that into the coaching world. Um, in, in, a, in a way um, that really um, changes, shifts the focus to self-actualization and transcendence. I didn't really give you that, that much <laughs> details, did I? But Well, I know I have to buy the book. As Arlene well, said, that I can already order it in, at yeah. Amazon. So I will go through the book. And if I have any specific question, I would definitely uh, get to you again. Or join our coaching program next year. <laughs> yes, I might. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm always happy to uh, you know just drop me an email uh, for free. <laughs> like, you know, okay. like I, you, I'm not. It's it's yeah. been recorded, Scott. I know, I know, it's been recorded. It's funny. <laughs> you're 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 funny. No, I like your energy. <laughs> I like your energy. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Paulette. It's so nice to see you here, and. Uh, uh, I see Carmen ask a question. What's your opinion about meditation? Yes, uh, maybe this will be the last question. Yes. My, headphone, my headphones are about okay. to die. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I really uh, have been through quite a journey uh, to um, what I think about meditation. I, I was very skeptical of it uh, at first and uh, then uh, really took it seriously. Um, and found I learned a lot from the experience. Um, I just put a, a link to an article I wrote on my mindful, my meditation experience. Um, I have found 
that meditation is uh, is a great way for me to um, uh, to not get so attached to my the drama of my mind um, and to see it from a different perspective. Um, it has made me much less anxious um, overall. I, I have suffered from generalized anxiety disorder throughout my life, and it really helped me with that. Um, but I don't, again, I like any of these spiritual practices, I don't think they're the, as I think the word is panacea. Um, they're not the one-off quick fix it all. We need to be very clear that this stuff is, uh, uh, needs to be integrated into the rest of our life or else we can have, uh, I'll send you another article I wrote on spiritual narcissism. <laughs> Uh, we can run into spiritual narcissism by thinking that any of these things will make us enlightened, um, but they can help make us enlightened. But anyway, I'll, I'll end there and uh, just uh, thank everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending and and thank you, Arlen. Uh, am I saying your name right, Arlen? Uh, well, uh, it's Arlen. written Arlen, but it's Arlene. Arlene. It's... I've been. I feel like I've been saying it wrong. Yeah. Arlene, Arlene. Arlene. Yes. Sol Solodkin. Yes. Solodkin. Solodkin. Exactly. Arlene. Arlene Solodkin. So Arlene Solodkin. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Muchas thank gracias. Yeah. Thank you, uh, everyone, so much, and thank you, Scott, for uh, making up space in your really busy agenda to come and and speak to us. Um, I, I really, really appreciate it. So, my pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. So, hopefully, a, I come back sometime. Oh, yeah. My pleasure. Anytime. Thank you so <laughs> much. I wish you luck in everything you do. And we'll be buying your book, uh, Choose Growth and also Transcend. <laughs> Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Gracias a todos. Un enorme placer compartir esta noche con ustedes. Que estén muy bien. Hasta luego.